Hello and welcome to Murder with Friends, the show where two friends get together and talk about the darker sides of history. I'm your host, Grace Baldridge, and joining me today is one of my favorite people in the entire <laughs> world, one of my oldest friends. You came on for one of the first episodes of Murder with Friends, Darren Dean. Hi. Darren, welcome to the new and improved Thank you. Murder with I'm, Friends. I'm glad to be back. So yeah. you you did come on the show mm -hmm. before, uh, yeah, but again, I referenced stages. these episodes before. Uh -huh. You guys will never see them unless you want to get members content. We're gonna Amir and I are gonna start reacting to the early episodes. Yeah. But you came on before we knew what the show was, yeah. and that was you, your episode stuck out to me because we talked about Andre Chikatilo, who is who we're gonna be talking about today. Yep. But the format of the show was that I did a whole bunch of research, <laughs> sat you down, and just spat facts yeah. at you and sort of told you that we were gonna have coffee in the afternoon and <laughs> that you might be on camera. And then it was like, oh, by the way, he ate body parts. Yeah, so it was a little bit overwhelming, but I think this time I've done a little research of my own, so I'm a little bit more mentally prepared. <laughs> so I'm ready to go. I think this I think this time it's gonna work out a lot better. Yeah. I think this one is actually gonna make it this, on this a channel. This is gonna be the one. <laughs> so how do you and I, really quickly, how do we know each other? So. Grace and I went to college together during our dark years, as I like to call it. Um, so we went to the same college for one year, and then we both transferred out, and we stayed friends. So that's the short version of it. There's because a lot more sadness things in bonds there. People. Yeah, there's a lot more in there that we don't really want to talk about. Friends that are sad yeah. together stay together. <laughs> exactly. I think that's what we learned. <laughs> and what is uh, sort of your interest in true crime or murder or cases, yeah. prolific killers? Um, I guess like. My mom and I and my sisters, we all started watching Forensic Files, like the old school, you know, murder documentaries when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of just like grew up kind of being fascinated by it and like watching it at night with my mom and my sisters. Um, and now she's onto Dateline. So now we watch Dateline. Oh, she's, she's ratcheted up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you go from she's Forensic moving Files, because that's only 30 minutes to Dateline. Exactly. An hour An commitment. hour long, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. So today we're going to be talking about Andre Chikatilo, who was uh, a case that you guys, a figure you guys have requested, and we are honoring these requests. We're trying to go a little bit more international in 2017, as I've said before. He was a Soviet killer uh, who was around or active between 1978 and 1990. I think it's important to mention from what I've read on Reddit that he was a Ukrainian killer that killed people in Russia. So a lot of people say that he was this Russian serial killer. I think the term that's more appropriate is Soviet. But he uh, has confirmed to kill uh, 53 people independently. That's yeah. what we can mm -hmm. confirm. But he has claimed that he has killed about 56 people. And uh, with that being said, we're going to dive into his story. But let's go to our first clip of who we're going to be talking about today. Andre Chikatilo. Between December of 1978 and November 1990, Andre Chikatilo's murderous career saw him kill at least 56 people according to his own confession, making him out as one of the worst serial killers in history based on pure numbers alone. Hints of the monster that Chikatilo would become began to surface when he worked as a teacher, with numerous accusations of sexual assault being made against him by students that eventually led to his firing in 1981. However, his killings had started before that final assault, with the murder of Yelena Zakotnova in 1978 following a failed rape attempt. He seemed to have stabbed his victims in a frenzy before mutilating their body and dumping it. On occasion, tongue tips and some of the organs of his victims appear to have been bitten off, hinting at cannibalistic nature. So, hope you weren't eating. Um, but with that being said, we're going to dive into his childhood and his upbringing. And I, I think this is a really interesting part of Chikatilo's story because the setting with which he was raised, I think, um, absolutely played a part into his his psychosis and how he developed into a killer and just what he was exposed to. He was born October 16th, 1936 in, and I'm going to butcher a lot of names here, so please, Ukrainian and Russian viewers in the comment <laughs> section, please be nice to me. Uh, Yabla Konoya, Ukraine. And this was a rural Ukrainian village and uh, suffering very heavily under some of Stalin's agricultural collectivization um, policies and this caused widespread famine. Um, just a, a lot of poverty that was just throughout the country right now that, mm -hmm. that he was growing up in, and this affected his uh, his development as a kid. Can you sort of expand yeah, on that? Yeah, so um, I was doing a little bit of research on it, and um, it said that um, when he was born, um, he he was believed to have, to have suffered from water on the brain, which caused him to have um, a genital urinary tract um, issues later in life, including bedwetting, which I'm sure we'll talk about, um, which kind of caused him to get teased a lot in school. Um, so he, he had a bedwetting problem up until his late teens. Um, and later in his life, which is 
kind of an important um, aspect of his um, of his killing is that he he um, he was unable to sustain an erection. Right, he was yeah. impotent, and that is a major. Uh, point in his life and is something that he struggled with throughout his life that mm -hmm. definitely comes up, especially in trial, which we yeah. will definitely get to. He was raised also uh, without a father. His father yeah. was, I mean, he knew who he was, but he was at war a lot. And just to give you a little bit of an idea of what Chikatilo was being raised in, what the climate was in Ukraine during this time, let's go to a clip right now, narrated by my girl Meryl Streep about, um, well, about this time in Ukraine's history. Let's take a look. In the 1930s, the Soviet government, under Joseph Stalin, turned on its own people, as Stalin mobilized a vast state apparatus to crush those he considered a threat to his power. No fewer than 20 million people lost their lives. How did Soviet communism come to kill so many of its own? While some died in labor camps, and others starved in state-induced famine. More than one and a half million men and women were executed for crimes against the state. The period has come to be known as the Great Terror. So that really sets the scene mm -hmm. for what will be a, a, a dark life that was uh, that existed in a dark time in a country's history, which I, I think is just the setting here um, is particularly harsh, perhaps the harshest of any killer that we've covered mm -hmm. so far, because Definitely. you hear about uh, there's trouble in ho at home and um, things aren't going so well, but maybe he was you know, born into poverty, but this was a deeply ingrained national poverty. Right. The he said that he didn't even know the taste of bread until he was 12 years old. I wow. mean, that, that sort of hunger, yeah. that ache. Um, another thing that I thought was really interesting was that his mom told him that his own brother had been murdered and cannibalized, although this has never been confirmed. Yeah. Um, and that the brother may not have ever existed, but that mm -hmm. his mom told him this to sort of keep him in line. And then again, he was also bedwetting. There's there's a lot going on within his, his family structure yeah. and his mom doing what she could to keep her son in check. Mm -hmm. um, and then also there's a lot going on in just the culture of Ukraine at the time. It just sets a really sinister scene for mm -hmm. what is to come. But that being said, he he starts to lead a pretty boring life. Yeah. <laughs> um, everything is pretty dark and bleak for him, but he just goes on. He's a model student. Uh, he's an ardent communist. Uh, he also uh, is impotent. And now I think we should sort of talk about that because yeah. while he goes on, he's good in school. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of friends. He's kind of nerdy. The major factor that comes into play is his lack of success with women. Mm -hmm. And um, I read that he had a number of unsuccessful and humiliating uh, sexual encounters that were at the age of 15 or 17 where he would try and overpower a girl. Yeah, and I think I think um, kind of the first time that he found that he kind of liked that feeling of, of um, you know, overpowering a girl was, I think it said he was maybe 17 and she was 11 and it was like, one of his sister's friends or something, and mm -hmm. he overpowered her. And while she was struggling, he he um, he ejaculated. And so, like, although he didn't, you know, have sex or anything, he found that when he was, you know, in this act of the basically, power play. yeah, yeah. So being in in that place where he was overpowering somebody, he like actually got to feel a release finally. That's so interesting yeah. that early on he would make note that the, it's the power struggle that right. really arouses him and excites mm -hmm. him. Um, and just that he was so young when he discovered that yeah. is really unsettling. And it's also unsettling because he goes on to become a teacher. So he's a, tele, he's a telephone engineer for a time and he moves to Russia and he lives with his sister, but then he becomes a, a, t a teacher. That's something that he's interested in doing, speaking with young people, mm -hmm. working with young people, and knowing what he had already known about himself and his right. relationship to those who are younger than him. That's what's so creepy about it. Yeah. Um, so he lives with his sister. She, uh, they live together. And then in 1963, Pretty shortly after they started living together, she gets sick of him. <laughs> surprise. I mean, yeah, surprise, surprise. And uh, she sets him up with a, a local spinster. I I don't think that's a very nice word, but everything that I've read has sort of said she was a, uh, a lonely woman. Mm -hmm. Some have said that she was divorced. I found two uh, accounts of her name, Faina or Fedoja. So 
that's another the public record is a little bit difficult to track right. down mm -hmm. given that this was you know uh, so what Soviet era yeah. Russia mm -hmm. and that is going to get even more frustrating when we get into the investigation <laughs> yeah. but just tracking down little details on what was the given name at birth for right. his uh, wife is frustrating mm -hmm. um, they have two kids despite his uh, sex problems mm -hmm. and um, he just continues being a school teacher, but very quickly, around 1971, 1970s, uh, complaints come in mm -hmm. from parents and from other teachers. And uh, I don't know if you've heard any of these that you want to share an anecdote about. Right. I mean, I, I just read that he basically had to move from school to school to kind of avoid getting in trouble for, um, you know, having like um, inappropriate relations with kids. Um, or just even sexual harassment. That's yeah. what I was reading about. Mm -hmm. I read that uh, he, one of his jobs at one of the schools he worked at was for kids that were in boarding school. Mm -hmm. He had to make sure that they were in their dorms at the correct time. Oh, okay. And he would schedule his uh, walk-ins when they would likely be changing. Right. And a lot of this was also young girls. So when we get into the victimology a little bit later, we'll see that he didn't really discriminate across uh, age, although they were young, um, and he didn't really discriminate across genders either, but his early sexual deviance predominantly did exist uh, girls, yeah. with girls. Mm -hmm. So that's something I think is interesting, worth noting. And something that really sits not well with me, Darren, about this is that he was able to find teaching work despite what you mentioned yeah. between 1971. He was able to switch schools and just kind of keep avoiding For getting the better in trouble. part of a decade. Yeah, while still continuing to like sexually harass these kids. Yeah, and he um, hadn't really yeah. ratcheted it up yet. Mm -mm. Um, but I, I think that we see over a decade, because of the lack of oversight and regulation and communication within these school departments, which is, again, remember what time period yeah. we're talking about, he he was able to get away with so much. Yeah. And that there, people had no idea who they were hiring. And a, a lot of what this story comes back to for me is sort of the the monster next door could be your yeah, teacher. exactly. But he does ratchet up over these 10 years. It's not enough to just th this sort of, um, this harassment, um, this, it, it, one, someone said that they, he assaulted them in a swimming pool, which is so terrifying for me because I'm a bad swimmer. <laughs> um, he does ratchet it up. And I want to go to a clip right now talking about this first murder and what it would lead to. First, he acquired a small shack in a rundown neighborhood. In December, he took a nine-year-old girl there. Her name was Yelena Zakatnova. Her friends called her Lena. He'd met her at a bus stop and offered her something Soviet children rarely enjoyed, bubble gum. She agreed to follow him to the house. He encountered this girl and first discovered with her that violence on the body of a girl was something that would get him excited. As he began to molest her, he, he, he grew increasingly excited and wanted more direct sexual contact with her. He was unable to perform sexually, so he used a knife instead. It was the moment when he discovered that murder was his passion. After that, he knew himself in a new way. So at this point, a killer is born. Yeah. He hasn't yet descended to the serial killer madness that we will eventually know as Andre Chikatilo, but he realizes that this is the ultimate release yeah, for him. Yeah, definitely and took a turn here. The 10 years of uh, sexual assault, harassment, um, misconduct pales in comparison to what he feels for killing this girl. He goes on to dump her body in the river, dump her bags in the river. Um, and then even though there were multiple witnesses that placed him around the scene at the time that, that were able to see him and that did report this to authorities, uh, his wife gave him an alibi because remember he was married with two kids at the yeah. time. He was a teacher. He wasn't what we would think of or what anyone would think of as the, you know, a, a madman, a, a killer that's gonna, right. you know, abduct a nine-year-old girl. How could he abduct a nine-year-old girl? Yeah. He's a teacher mm -hmm. and th all his misconduct was hidden from the record. It's, so, yeah, it's, it's very troubling. Not only that nobody kind of like took a step back and was like, okay, look at his history. Mm -hmm. is, this, is this a possibility? But also that his wife, you know, even though he obviously wasn't there at the time, she was totally okay with lying about it. And right. I, I mean, she she probably didn't know anything that was going on either, but still. No one would assume that. Yeah, exactly. No one he would wasn't where he said he was, was so yeah. therefore he's a killer. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, and then also another man 
is convicted and killed of this crime, of the yeah. nine-year-old girl. And it's only later that he would confess that it was in fact him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I was reading that um, they're um, sort of their, um, like the way that they would interrogate people was so harsh that they would get a lot of uh, false confessions for, for things that people didn't even do. So um, that kind of just is like another um, just way that he, he didn't get caught again for like a, a short period of time. Yeah, sort of a, a warped and perverted justice system yep. that is looking for a, a sort of a clean way of tidying up a case rather than exactly. hunting down the truth. And we're, we're, we're gonna get into that for sure because, uh, well, the, the police attention, even though it was minor and didn't apprehend him, really freaked him out. So he moves to the small town of Rostov, and this is where things really pick up in the Andrei Chikatilo story. This is where he becomes a serial killer. He has access to public transportation. This changes everything. And when we come back, we're gonna tell you all about his descent into serial killer infamy. 